Hello everybody, this is Mr. Matthews again, and today the topic is the Great Reform Act of 1832, the first step on the road to democracy in Britain. So, let's have a look at the Great Reform Act. So first of all, what actually is democracy? Well, it's supposed to be the idea that it's the people that really run the country. They elect the MPs to Parliament, but it's because most people have the right to vote means that those MPs are accountable to the people who put them into power and they can be got rid of if they, if they don't do a good job. So if you don't like the government, if you don't like Boris Johnson or whatever, you can get rid of him in a democracy because you can vote him out of power. If you have a dictatorship like Hitler, you can't get rid of Hitler because he's got rid of democracy. So, so in a democracy, as long as you are 18 years of age and you're not in prison, you have the right to vote. Um, it doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, how well educated or not very well educated. It doesn't matter about the color of your skin. It doesn't matter about your religion. It doesn't, about, it doesn't matter about your, your level of intelligence. None of that matters or where you live or what kind of house you live in you have a right to vote and you can do this in secret. There's a secret ballot, which means that nobody can intimidate you. So if you want to vote for the Conservatives, you can vote for the Conservatives. If you want to vote for Labour, you vote for Labour or for anybody else. It's up to you, okay? Now this seems like a pretty sensible system and most people are supportive of democracy, but it took a long, long time for Britain to become a democracy. And the 1832 Act did not make Britain a democracy by a long, long way. But it was like a first step. It was a bit of a baby step. It was a small step. But it was the first step towards democracy. So, we have to start somewhere. And as I've said there, 1832. And then within 30 or so years, there will be another Act. And then another 20 years, another Act. And gradually, we're getting more democratic. And then in the 20th century, women are allowed to vote as well. In the 19th century, which is dominated by the Victorian period, although by in 1832, Victoria wasn't yet on the throne, it was only men who were getting the vote. It wasn't for women in, in, until the 20th century. So what was the system like before 1832? Well, a man called William Cobbett, who was on the side of the common people and against the rich and the powerful, he came up with a wonderful phrase. He called it old corruption. And it, it's represented there as a tree, which William Cobbett is trying to pull down. And it's basically a system where the rich and the powerful run the country for their own benefit and for their own wealth. It's just absolutely corrupt. <coughs> and it is not representative of the people at all. It's a pretty awful system. And William Cobbett hated it because he felt that this, this was a system in which the rich basically dominated the poor and they pushed the poor around and they basically took all the wealth for themselves. And it was a system that needed to be completely changed. The 1832 Reform Act changed it a little bit, but I mean, what William Cobbett would have liked was, would get rid of the system completely, which didn't happen in 1832. So this is, uh, this is uh, the painting by Thomas Gainsborough, which I showed in my Loom lecture on, on the Georgian period. And this is basically set, sums it up. If you own land, you have political power. So these are the gentry, but there's also the, the class above them, the aristocracy who owned even more land and lived in even bigger houses than the gentry. But basically land was power. Now, at this time, there's the Industrial Revolution and there's also industry and business. But the industrialists and the businessmen, the factory owners and, and so forth, they don't even have the vote. They will own the working class and the poor. So they want to challenge the aristocracy and the gentry who are, who are the landowners and they have political power simply because they own lots and lots and lots and lots of land. Okay. rotten pocket boroughs. This was where you hardly had any voters 
<laughs> it was like a little. Uh, it was like a, it was like a, a town that had been put and pulled in in the Middle Ages, but now only had a few people living in it, and yet it sent two members of Parliament. Whereas big industrial cities like Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, Newcastle, Leeds had no MPs, and they had thousands and thousands of people living there, and there were no MPs. Uh, and also the capital city, London, which was the biggest city in the world, had far fewer MPs than it should have done, considering its population. Have a look at Dunwich in Suffolk, which is in the east of England. It had a population of, 18, of, of 32 people, but it was still sending two MPs to Westminster. Whereas somewhere like Manchester, which I imagine would have about like 150,000, 200,000 people, had no MPs. Old Sarum in Wiltshire, near the city of Salisbury, had three houses and seven voters, and yet it still had two MPs. So this was, I mean, this is basically dominated by the landowning classes. We go back to Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. They basically run the system for their benefit. And that's why William Cobbett called it old corruption. And that is corrupt. There's no doubt why he called it old corruption. That is a pretty corrupt and awful system. Now, there's no Labour Party then, but the two parties, the Tories existed. They became the Conservative Party of today, although they're still called Tories. The Whigs became the Liberal Party. Labour comes later in history. Now, they were both really dominated by rich people, particularly Londoners. They were great Whig Londoners and great Tory Londoners. But there was a difference. The Whigs were more what we call left wing. They wanted to change society more. They weren't so strong about the monarchy that, and they wanted Parliament to be stronger. And they did believe in reform of Parliament. They wanted to change Parliament to make it more representative of the people. On the other hand, the Tories were against any change at all. They were what we call more right wing. They basically felt that any change to the system would be disastrous. And the reason for that was the fear of revolution. The French Revolution of 1789 had terrified the rich people all over Europe because it was the fear that the revolution would spread across borders. So that's the storming of the Bastille, which was the king's um, great uh, fortress in Paris. And there you have the common people rising up, liberty, equality, fraternity, rights of the common man and the common woman. And this terrified the rich. So, although Mr. and Mrs. Andrews is, is, is before the French Revolution, but if you could imagine a few generations down the line of, of the Andrewses, they were, would have been horrified at the idea that the, the revolution in France could spread to good old England. And therefore, they were against reform. And that's what the Tories said. Now, the Whigs also used the French Revolution as an example, but they turned the argument around. The Tories said, if we have any change, if we change the political system, it will start, it will start a revolution and the common people will, will come out of the slums and the gutters and they'll destroy everything, they'll burn down our houses, they'll steal our property, they'll murder us in, in our beds, it'll be, it'll be horrible. But the Whigs said, no, it's the other way around. If you don't change the system a little bit, then you will have a revolution. But if you change it a little bit and you make it a, a, a bit fairer, you'll stop the revolution. So they both used the example of the French Revolution. The Tories said, we can't have change because it will cause revolution. And the Whigs said, we must have change because there will be revolution if there is no change. So they both used the, revol the French Revolution as an example. Now, the Tories had been in power for a long, long time. They'd been in power at the time of the French Revolution, and they'd been power in power right throughout the long war against Napoleon and afterwards. But in 1830, there was a general election, and the Whigs came to power, led by a man called Earl Grey. And he gives, he does actually give his name to the kind of tea, which is a, a, a particularly very pleasant taste of tea, and he, he, so he's a politician and he gives his name to a type of tea. And he was a Whig and he believed that the political system had to be changed. So he believed 
that unless you change the political system, there would be a revolution. So let's change it, but let's change it by a small amount and let's change it nice and slowly. So Earl Grey wants to change Britain. Now, the middle classes, the businessmen, the merchants, the lawyers um, and so forth, they certainly wanted the vote and the working class wanted the vote and they came together. Now, normally the middle and the working class were like not always on best of terms. So for example, if you were a factory owner in Manchester and if you were a factory worker in Manchester, you were normally on the other side of the class divide. You saw that the middle class factory owner as the enemy. But what happened in this period between 1830 and 1832 was the middle class and the working class came together <clears throat> to challenge the aristocracy and to challenge the landowners. So they wanted, they wanted to challenge the landowners so that so that the middle uh, uh, so that the middle class could get the vote what the middle class were hiding from the working class is that if they got the vote they wouldn't give it to the working class and earl grey was absolutely determined that only the middle class is not the working class should get the vote but the working class didn't understand that they thought that when the act was passed they would get the vote as well and it was a massive disappointment when the Act came out because it didn't give them the vote. <clears throat> so what happens is they put they, they put what is called a bill together. Now a bill is a law or an act of parliament which has not yet become an act of parliament. It's like a series of measures. This is what we want to do, but it has to pass through parliament first. It has to get voted by enough. Uh, members of parliament in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords and then it becomes a law and then it becomes an act of parliament. So it's only a bill to begin with, it's called the Great Reform Bill. Now, the Great Reform Bill would change the system, not hugely, but enough to make a reasonable difference. But the House of Lords was against it. Now the House of Commons was okay because the Whig party had a majority in the House of Commons. That's why Earl Grey was Prime Minister, okay? But the House of Lords, which is not elected by anybody, they were just hereditary peers. They just, you know, they, they were Lord so-and-so and they'd inherited it from their father. They were dominated by, by the Tories and they said no. So this was a real, this was a real problem. This could actually start a revolution in effect. In fact, there were riots. There were riots in, in a number of British cities. There were, there, were, there were big riots in London. The Duke of Wellington, the great general who had beaten Napoleon at Waterloo, his house in Hyde Park was, his windows were smashed in Hyde Park by rioters because he was a top Tory and he was against the Reform Act. So um, that was in London. This is Bristol. This is where the worst riots. The city of Bristol was almost burnt down and they had to bring the army and you can see cavalry soldiers there, they're the Scots Greys and they are using their big swords called sabres against the people, lots of people were killed and the amount of damage was like unbelievable, millions and millions of pounds of damage because people were so angry that the House of Lords who were not elected by anybody was against the, was against the Great Reform Bill. So how, how was Earl Grey to get, to get around this? The, the bill had to be passed in the House of Lords as well as the House of Commons. But as soon as it went to the House of Lords, the House of Lords said no one, so it was thrown back to the House of Commons. And it was like, we're not making any progress. This is like a real problem. How do we get it through? Well, what Earl Grey did was quite clever. He went to the king. Now the king was William the Fourth. 18th, he was king from 1830 to 1837. And then you have Queen Victoria. He was in the Navy as a young man. That's why he's got a naval uniform on. And he was mildly sympathetic to the Whigs, slightly more to the Whigs than to the Tories. And so Earl Grey had a nice couple of meetings with the king and he said to the king, your majesty, 
we've got a real problem in this country. We could have a revolution. We could have all kinds of problems, riots in the streets and all that, because the Tories dominate the House of Lords and they won't let the Great Reform Bill through. Now, you have the authority to create members of the House of Lords. You can make somebody an Earl. You can make somebody a Duke. If you can make enough Whigs members of the House of Lords, then you can swamp the House of Lords with Whigs, and the Whigs will support the Great Reform Bill. So, so the Tory Lords will be pushed to one side. And that's what what he did. But in fact, what happened is that is that the king threatened to do it. He didn't actually do it. The House of Lords remained dominated by the Tories. But what the, the plan was, and Earl Grey was quite clever in thinking this up. If you went to the Tory House of Lords and said, look, you won't let this bill through. Well, we'll get rid of your majority in the House of Lords and we'll make the majority Whig. The Tories didn't like that at all. So they backed down and they agreed to the Great Reform Bill, which became the Great Reform Act. Now, these are the measures of the Great Reform Act. It's a bit complicated, so I'll simplify it for you. Basically, it made the system more, much more fair and much more sensible. So big cities like Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, Leeds, Newcastle, they at last got two MPs because of their large population. London got more MPs than it did have because of its mostly it's a very big population. And there were more seats in the counties as well. It was more representative of the people. It gave the middle class people the vote, but not the working class people. So the working class people were really disappointed, but the middle classes were really happy. And of course, that is what Earl Grey had always wanted to do. He did not want to give the working class the vote. He didn't trust the working class. He thought, well, you know, if, if they have the vote, they will get rid of the rich. They will change society so much. But the middle classes, you know, you can basically trust them. So the working class felt very, very betrayed because they had fought to get that the bill passed. It was mainly the working class who were, who were involved in the riots, but they got nothing. So what they did, sorry, that's the wrong one there. What they did was to set up a new organization called the Chartists. And they put together six points they said that should be a vote for every man of 21 years of age and sound mind. But no women, you notice. Even they didn't think that women should be given the vote. They wanted a secret ballot so there would be no corruption and there would be no intimidation. You could vote with whatever candidate you wanted in safety. No property qualifications for MPs. Payment of MPs. Now that seems incredible that MPs weren't paid, but because they were so rich, because they were big landowners, or now big factory owners or merchants, they had plenty of money and, and they didn't need to they didn't need to actually get to actually get paid anything. There should be equal constituency sizes. So every constituency that sent an MP should be of roughly the same population and there should be annual parliaments. The annual parliaments is the only one that we, we, we still don't have. We have five years between elections. Of course now we have eighteen years and women have the right to vote as well. Later on in the 19th century, working class men got the vote in 1867 and in 1884. But it was when the rich felt that they deserved to get it. In other words, it was a privilege which was given by the rich and the powerful, not a right that they demanded. So it was a privilege, not a right. Okay. And it was very, very slow. And it wasn't until the later Victorian period that all working class men, 1867, it was more the skilled working class. And in 1884, it was the unskilled working class. Women did not get the vote until the 20th century. These, of course, are the suffragettes who were just before the time of the First World War. They were campaigning to get votes for women. You get Mrs. Pankhurst. And um, you get uh, Mary Davidson, who threw herself in front of the King's horse at the Derby in, in, in 1913, all that stuff. 
women aged 30 and over got the vote in 1980, and women aged 21 and over got the vote in 1928. And then they, they reduced the vote to 18 for all people in the 1960s. So by then, Britain was a complete democracy. But in actual fact, even before the Second World War, Britain was a, was really a democracy. So when we say that, you know, the war against Hitler was the war for democracy, that is basically accurate. So there we are, everybody. It was a long process, but we can say that the Great Reform Act was the first step on a long road. So, so it's, 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 it's a long journey to democracy we've got there. It's a long journey, but the Great Reform Act was the first step. Okay. Thank you very much for listening to the Loom Lecture.